uh, who is currently a assistant professor in uh, Indiana University in the Department of Geography. Okay, so uh, Tosh grew up in uh, North England in the Lakes District, uh, but she did not become a limnologist and instead decided to think a little bit bigger than just lakes and uh, went to Oxford for her undergraduate where she studied earth science and looked at some climate issues and family climate, but uh, later on moved over to the University College of London uh, where she worked with Matt Disney on um, carbon cycle modeling and worked specifically on methane cycling with peatlands. Um, something that those of you in the class will look at later in the semester. Um, after finishing her PhD, she went over to LSE in France and worked on global scale modeling, which is, I think, some of the material that we'll hear about today, and really thinking about the role of the terrestrial biosphere in our system. Uh, after her time there, she was at the University of Arizona, uh, working on semi-arid systems, uh, something that I think her advisor didn't really care about, but yeah. the, the kind of like, do something interesting. Okay. What are you going to do in Arizona, yeah, right? right? I think uh, there's some really cool science that's come out of that as well. Um, and then uh, a couple of years ago, I joined the faculty at Indiana, where she's been growing the lab. And also teaching, uh, similar to our class, a class on uh, terrestrial ecosystem modeling and, and using a similar book uh, from Gordon Bonin as well. And so she knows everything that you're dealing with. And for those of you in the class. And so the title of today's talk is Constraining Global Lens or His Model Carbon Budgets and Successes, Challenges, and Future Opportunities. Right over to Thanks. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've heard so many good things about research that's going on in Madison and about Madison itself. I've never been, so it's really great to be here. And um, thank you for the introduction. As, as Ankara mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the bulk of some research that I've done over the past six, maybe six plus years, um, looking at global uh, terrestrial biosphere models or land surface models, looking specifically at the carbon budgets, and trying to constrain these models with, with data. Um, and this is a team of people that I've been working with and still work with now, most of them are in France still, um, but yeah, we continue our collaboration. So. To acknowledge those folks as well. Um, so just a brief outline of my talk. I'll be giving you a little bit of context and motivation for this research. Uh, why do we need to improve our projections of the terrestrial, terrestrial carbon cycle? Um, and then I will make the case for why we need these statistical model data integration or data simulation frameworks to constrain these models. Um, I'll give a bit of background of whistle-stop tour really through uh, the, some of the studies that we've done as a team. And then a brief bit of, of having done these kind of model data integration studies, what have we learned about the global carbon cycle? Still very early days in, in terms of figuring out uh, how that's impacting our global carbon cycle budgets. And then some of the challenges we've faced along the way and at the end, a few perspectives on, on how we can improve things in the future. A lot of work still to be done. Um, so, to the context, um, as many of you, I'm guessing, know, we've been emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through our emissions from fossil fuels, as well as land use change, land cover change, and agriculture for a good 150 plus years now. And we know that um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that is trapping uh, radiation in the atmosphere and, and therefore causing warming and climate change. Um, and so we know then that this is impacting all sorts of the parts of the Earth system, and I'm mostly focusing on, on terrestrial ecosystem responses to these changes, um, and particularly thinking about the, the global carbon cycle. So what do we know about how all this increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is then impacting the global carbon cycle. This plot shows uh, the global carbon budget that is produced by the global carbon projects each year, and they try to account for all the components of this global cycle. So they, they account for the fossil fuel emissions, they try and get all those estimates from different national statistics. Um, and reporting, they try and account for all this land cover change, this agriculture, the emissions for that, from that. Um, they measure how much of that is, how much of those emissions are staying in the atmosphere. Um, and then we know from that, from doing that accounting, that the ocean and the terrestrial 
ecosystems are consuming or absorbing about 50% roughly of the CO2 that we're emitting into the atmosphere. And this is sort of changing over time, but we have a fairly good estimate of how, how much the ocean is taking up, and that's about half of what the terrestrial ecosystems are taking up, so about a quarter of the emissions. Um, and then the land surface is usually the most uncertain part of that. So I guess a lot of different processes going on, a lot of different human activity, a lot of different things we still don't understand yet. Um, and so we, my, my goal in a lot of my research is to try and get better estimates of how much um, CO2 the land is taking up, and more specifically, which processes are responsible, which regions. So we know that that the terrestrial biosphere is taking up about, say, a quarter to a third of these CO2 emissions. Um, I love taking photos, by the way, so I have my toxins and my photos. Um, we know that as a, on a global scale that forests are taking up a lot of these emissions, and grasslands as well. Um, what we really don't know is, or very well anyway, is whether it's more, say, tropical forests that are consuming all these um, CO2 emissions, or the boreal forests, things like that, split between different regions, uh, which regions are responsible, um, how much CO2 is absorbed by ecosystems is really a balance of the uptake of carbon by photosynthesis and plants uh, versus the release of carbon by respiration from the plants and the soil. And so we know less, you know, what the balance of these processes are and how that's different over different regions and changing over time. So a lot of the specifics of this carbon sink, this global carbon sink, are less well known or constrained. Um, and we really, we really need to get a better handle on that, um, especially figuring out, you know, which sort of biomass pools is this carbon ending up. So the land surface is taking up the CO2. Is it mostly going into the canopy? Is it finding its way and staying in the soil? Is it staying in the woody biomass? Um, and that's important because these different pools have different turnover times. So how long? Uh, the terrestrial biosphere might remain the same with carbon, depends on where the carbon ends up. Um, and of course then we need to think about the climate change and how that's going to affect this um, sort of carbon cycle, whether when we have drought, you know, that'll affect the, the plant's ability to take up carbon, and therefore will that weaken this terrestrial carbon sink. Um, if we have fires, as we're seeing a lot in Australia now and also in California, Obviously, that changes this carbon cycle, and how is that going to affect this carbon sink? So these are all the kind of questions behind that are motivating my, my research. And the main tool that I use for this is uh, what we call global terrestrial biosphere models, or land surface models, uh, also called ecosystem models, um, and dynamic vegetation models, so lots of different uh, uh, acronyms that we throw out there. So what we mean when we're talking about this is, is models that combine a representation of the hydrological cycle, uh, the surface energy fluxes, I guess these are all the processes that you're learning about in this class, as well as some idea of, of this carbon cycle, uptake by photosynthesis, um, allocation to different biomass pools, and then respiration from the plants and the soil, as well as ideas of disturbance from fire and things like that. And then these models, because they're global scale, they have a lot of, I got my pointer, um, global scale processes of long-term changes in vegetation, um, the land use land cover change, um, hydrological heterogeneity on the surface, like rivers and flooding. And then even more recently in these models, we have some idea of management, of how uh, we're managing the land, the forests, agriculture, how we're managing grazing land, for example. So these process-based models try to encapsulate all of our knowledge of how the terrestrial ecosystems, then both the natural processes um, and this management are affecting climate. And we try and combine all our knowledge in there and then study uh, some of the questions that I've, I've just mentioned. That's the, that's the idea. Um, I should mention, if you're not as familiar with these models, that we typically group all vegetation into very broad-scale plant functional types that represent different species.
species according to their physiology, their phenology, their structure. So it's, it's global scale and also some aspects are sort of relatively broad or simple um, so that we can run these models efficiently. Um, but of course, um, the models have uncertainties, as all models do. Uh, this is a plot showing the historical and up to future uh, an annual land CO2 flux um, from a range of different models. So we've got the zero line there, um, and when <coughs> the fluxes are positive, it's this, this is when we're talking about the sink of carbon dioxide into terrestrial ecosystems. And when it's negative, we're talking about um, a source of CO2. So the, the ecosystems are no longer taking up uh, carbon anymore. And as I mentioned, at the moment, the land surface, all these models here historically have been acting as a sink of carbon dioxide, and the models capture that. And in the historical to current period, the models really do fairly well. Um, they sort of uh, fairly well match together, although I will say that there are still lots of uncertainties when you do, when you compare specific processes. Um, I haven't shown you some past studies just for the sake of brevity, but if you, for example, look at the seasonal cycle of the vegetation, just the leaf area over time, and you look at, at how the models do compared to site-based data, they get very different growing season lengths, they get very different magnitudes of the, the leaf area. So there are a lot of uncertainties still going into these estimates. But then what's really alarming is that when we run these models forward over time, up to 2100, you then get a real divergence of these model estimates. With, some, with most models still predicting that the ecosystems remain the sink of carbon dioxide. But some models even predict that potentially with drought, or disturbance to the ecosystems, or just the physiology of, of how plants take up CO2, um, that this, the, the, the terrestrial ecosystems will become a source of carbon dioxide, which is really worrying when we think of, you know, we're trying to estimate what our allowable emissions are to keep within a, say, two degree temperature rise, two degree Celsius temperature rise, but if most of those estimates are based on the fact that we think ecosystems will remain a sink of CO2, but in fact some of them may predict that uh, the ecosystems will become a source, then that means we've actually got a narrower range of emissions that we're allowed before we can, um, before, to achieve a certain temperature rise. You know, we're going to have to, therefore we're going to have to think more carefully about curbing those emissions more rapidly. Um, so this kind of model uncertainty is something that is um, is the sort of key focus of my work as well, to try and reduce that uncertainty. And this paper, this plot was produced about 15 years ago. Um, this is a very similar plot produced about six or seven years ago now. You can see that this situation, different colored lines here, but that sort of spread in the future hasn't really changed. So we're not getting a handle yet on what's causing the uncertainties in different models and the differences between models. And what um, is a cause of concern for me more than that is that each of these individual lines is sort of one model run. Um, these models are very hard to run. They take up a lot of computational time. So it's, it's tricky to estimate their uncertainty, but there are no uncertainty bounds on these models. And we're typically, we've been so um, uh, focused, I guess, on developing these models, including all these relevant processes for studying these biosphere climate feedbacks, that we haven't got a strong handle on how to estimate uncertainty in models from both the structural uncertainty related to the processes in the models, are they accurately represented, have we got all the right processes in the models, and also the parameters of these models. And parameters refers to the fixed values. So one example might be the maximum leaf area that a, that a certain plant functional type can have. Um, and so those are two of, of the main sources of uncertainty and we really haven't estimated uh, very rigorously um, or carefully the uncertainty in these models. So that's the sort of big picture context behind the work that I that I've been doing and I'm presenting here. So I'm going to make the case now for why we need this statistical framework to combine data and models to estimate 
specifically the pr parameter uncertainty, um, just related to these fixed values in the models, and specifically looking at vegetation dynamics and carbon cycle uh, processes. So, what are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about model data integration or data assimilation? Um, what we want to do is, is basically take all these different carbon cycle related data streams that we have across all these different spatial scales and temporal scales, a huge amount of data out there, um, and really confront the models with that data to try and reduce the uncertainty in models. And we're doing this in a Bayesian statistical framework and what that means is we have this equation written over here which might look a little scary, but it's what we call a cost function or a misfit function, and it basically describes just the misfit between the model and the data. Um, so we've got the model with the specific parameters we're looking at here, and then the data, and we're looking at the difference between those um, two things. And we take into account, this is the sort of more statistical part, uh, we take into account uncertainty in both the models and the data uh, to try and reduce that uncertainty. And because it's a Bayesian approach, that means that we're trying to update some prior information using this statistical framework. And in this case, because we're looking at parameter uncertainty, we've got an estimate of our prior, prior information on our parameters. So what we think these parameters should be, for example, what we think the maximum leaf area for trees versus grasses should be. Um, and so that, that defines this whole misfit function, and what we're trying to do with our inversion algorithm, with our data simulation algorithm, is, is find the parameter sets um, across all these different processes in the model that reduces this misfit. So we're trying to reduce the misfit between the model and the data as much as possible. And then the hope is then that we can tackle this spread and try and reduce each individual's model uncertainty um, and then try and reduce some of the spread across models. Um, it's just a, a sort of one step in that direction. But furthermore, it's just good to use this kind of framework just to quantify the uncertainty. So we have an estimate of just what the uncertainty is at all. And then of course the, the ultimate goal is to improve our future climate projections and also to, to learn some things about processes because where we can't fit the model well to data we have to then assume that we don't understand how those processes work very well or we haven't represented them well in the model um, and so we, we have to then look back and, and back to the data itself and see what, how, what our understanding is. So this is um, uh, the global data assimilation system that we set up around this Orchidae uh, land surface model, terrestrial biosphere model that I was working on when I was in France. It is um, one of the, um, it is the land surface component of one of the French Earth System models, the IPSL model. If you're ever reading some of the climate change projection papers and you see the Earth System model acronyms, it's the IPSL model. And this is the land part, the land Orchidae model. And so in the beginning, when we were setting up this, this framework, we were using um, data that were really widely available, both satellite data of vegetation activity, that I'll talk about in a minute, or solar-induced fluorescence, that is a good proxy for the amount of photosynthesis uh, that plants are, are carrying out. Um, so satellite data are obviously widely available and provided freely by NASA, which is excellent. Um, but then we also used networks of flux power data, I think you may be familiar with. Um, these are towers that are measuring the net CO2 exchange with the atmosphere, with the surface even, and um, also some latent heat flux um, data as well. And we're really focusing on those in the beginning because these are really widely available, easy to, to get hold of as well. But sometimes we, we've also done some studies on just using some very site-based biomass measurements of the of the woody biomass as well. And so at this part of the system, we're just looking at the, the land part of the model. But another widely used data set that we've used is actually atmospheric CO2 concentration measurements. So these are also measured at big tall towers, um, much bigger than the flux towers, and they're measuring the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And because then we, we have an atmospheric measurement, we then need the whole Earth system model. That's messed up there. 
the whole Earth system model so that we have the CO2 fluxes from the ocean that are simply prescribed in this framework, all mixing with the land surface CO2 fluxes in the atmosphere, in the atmospheric part of the model. And so when we're, when we're using these atmospheric CO2 concentration data, we need this whole uh, land uh, Earth system framework. We also need to estimate fossil fuel and biomass burning fluxes and things like that. Um, so that we have all the, the right mixing in the atmosphere. Um, and so we're trying to constrain different parts of the model with these different data sets. And what I'm going to do really briefly now is, is give you a whistle-stop tour through some of the main results that we got when we uh, tried to optimize the model parameters using these different data sets. So starting off with satellite vegetation activity, uh, this is one of the first studies that I was doing with this whole system. I was using satellite normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI data, which if you're unfamiliar with that, is a proxy for vegetation greenness. Um, and what I was trying to do with that data was constrain just the phenology uh, in the model. So this is really parameters that are related to the timing of leaf, leaf growth and leaf senescence. That shows you some of the parameters in this diagram here. Things like temperature and moisture thresholds, these parameters um, are related to when the leaves start growing or when they start um, senescing. Also things like critical leaf age and, and parameters that are controlling the rate of growth and the rate of fall. But really just looking at the timing. Um, and we related this to the leaf area index um, that was um, prescribed by, uh, sorry, predicted by the model um, via this FAKAR relationship that I won't go into um, unless, unless you're interested on, on that, but basically um, what we did was we normalized this NDVI data and we normalized the model LAI data, so we're just looking at the timing of these um, two data sets, the model and the data, not any overall magnitude um, uh, parameters. And we had about four to six of these phenology parameters for each deciduous plant functional types. We didn't touch the evergreen plant functional types in the model. Um, so we had, I haven't introduced all the different types of PFTs, but these acronyms here refer to things like temperate broadleaf deciduous forest, boreal broadleaf deciduous or boreal needleaf, C3 and C4 grasses. Um, and we chose so many random grid points for each different PFT. And what we found, these are mean seasonal cycles of both the normalized NDVI and the, and the normalized LAI, if you like, or the FA power in the model. The observations are in, in black there. The prior model, before any constraint with the data, is in blue. If you ignore this yellow curve for now, um, I can talk about the details of that um, after this talk, but when we threw all the different sites, those 15 different sites in together, we got um, this red curve here, which is the posterior, curve after we've optimized these parameters. And this is for four different plant functional types that are really in the temperate and boreal zones. What we found in most of these different PFTs is that the model, without any data constraint, was predicting a too long growing season, and the senescence was happening too late. And after we constrained those phenology parameters that I showed on the previous um, slide, we found that the, the leaves started to fall much earlier and better fit, fit the observations. So that was a general picture that the model was, was overestimating this growing season length. You can see that in this global map here. This is the difference between the, the posterior simulation, after optimization, and the prior simulation um, in, the in the mean growing season length. And the brown shows a decrease in growing season length. And so especially across the northern hemisphere, here, we've got a big decrease in growing season length which then really impacts things like your energy fluxes, um, amount of carbon that's, up to, that's taken up by the ecosystem. So this was an important result that we could use satellite data to constrain phenology in the model. Then something I think you might have looked at uh, last week in class, this was um, a very similar setup to my previous study, but we were using solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence data, SIF data, to constrain parameters both related to phenology but also now photosynthesis. As I mentioned earlier, the fluorescence data is very linked to both synthesis 
um, related to how the leaves uh, take up energy for photosynthesis, but then they release a little bit um, as fluorescence that we can measure. And a bunch of different studies showed that this, this is the SIP, the fluorescence measurement, and the GPP, this is gross primary productivity, so it's the amount of carbon uptake from photosynthesis, um, are very linearly related quantities, um, with an exact slope depending on different PFTs, different biome types. So we took this as a very simple framework, um, and what we did was then very similar setup, exactly the same data simulation experiment setup as before, um, looking at phenology and photosynthesis parameters, but then we prescribed this just simple linear relationship between the GPP and the SIF, which was a big assumption, but on these scales, because of the, the studies that I mentioned in the last slide, we assumed that that was the case. So we also constrain these two parameters of this empirical relationship, the slope and intercept parameters. I should mention that since then, a colleague of mine has implemented a more process-based representation of the, the relationships between photosynthesis and fluorescence. Um, but I'm not going to present that today, um, but that's something that's out there I can mention to you, uh, talk to you about as well. We used um, a global SIF product from the GOM2 satellite. Again, very similar setup. So constraining photosynthesis and phenology related parameters. And what we saw then, this is um, the prior map of the GPP globally, um, and then the posterior map. Uh, so these are the spatial distributions of GPP. And this is the difference down here. So the difference between uh, the posterior and the prior, with blue showing a decrease in GPP. And we really found that across most of the biomes, most of the PFTs, except for the dryland PFTs, um, we saw a decrease in the GPP in the model. The model was predicting too much photosynthesis, too much GPP, before we constrained the parameters. So we saw this strong decrease across really the tropics and the northern hemisphere. You can't see this easily here, I'll show it briefly later, but we actually got more decrease in the northern hemisphere than in the tropics. So that actually shifted our sort of ratio of, of tropical to northern hemisphere forest carbon uptake, which speaks to these questions of which biomes are taking up the most carbon and things like that. As I mentioned, one of the most important things about um, this data simulation system is that we can better quantify uncertainty and reduce it quickly. And this map here shows um, the error reduction on our predictions of GPP. So we've got a sort of 83% error reduction, so we can better estimate the uncertainty on our GPP. Um, although I mentioned in the paper lots of reasons why this may be an overestimate of the reduction in uncertainty related to some sort of technical data simulation uh, issues that we still need to resolve. But still, a good first step, uh, these experiments in terms of better quantifying uncertainty. In the interest of speeding things through, I'll just mention this paper, I wasn't involved in this, it, it happened before my time, but um, this is uh, someone who was using <coughs> flux tower data to constrain the net ecosystem exchange or the net CO2 fluxes uh, across all sorts of different PFTs. So uh, that's represented on the bottom here, the mean seasonal cycles across um, all the sites for, that, for each PFT. Um, and just, he, he was constraining photosynthesis parameters, phenology, but also now respiration, because we're looking at that net CO2 exchange. And one thing to highlight was that um, they really captured the seasonal cycle of the NEE well, after um, constraining with the net ecosystem exchange fluxes. But if we take this one boreal evergreen needle leaf, um, the FT is an example, the, the prior is in green, and then the, if you ignore the yellow curve as well, and just look at the blue, it's hard to see here, but it, it, the posterior curve does match the observations much better, as we hope, after doing the optimization. But when we look at the, the two gross fluxes that make up the net flux, the GPP and the ecosystem respiration, we see that, and there's been some improvement compared to the observations, but we're still not fitting the observations really well. Um, and that's sort of compensating effects in both of these two fluxes that are working in opposite directions. Which makes the case more for using the SIF data as I just uh, presented to try and get a handle on one of the gross fluxes 
And in the future, we're going to be trying to use both the SIF data to constrain the GPP, as well as the net CO2 from a different data set to constrain the net flux and try and get that partitioning between these two fluxes much better. Um, whistle stop tour here. And then finally, I'll present um, the optimization we did with the atmospheric CO2 data. So as I mentioned, these are data that are collecting atmospheric CO2 concentrations in the, from the air itself. So we see this as a much more global scale constraint on our global scale net CO2 exchange fluxes at the surface because all of these um, surface fluxes are then mixed in the atmosphere with all other emissions from biomass burning and things like that. We see it as a, a much bigger constraint. And at this point, again, we're optimizing all carbon cycle parameters, phrenology, photosynthesis, respiration fluxes. And we also, at this point, then optimized a very simple scalar on the amount of soil carbon. So it's a parameter that just scales the amount of soil carbon um, in our model um, or by just a little bit. And the reason that we added that in was because uh, when we run these models, we run them up from essentially bare ground. Uh, it's called a spin-up, and we estimate how much soil carbon is built up over time. But obviously those estimates can be very uncertain because we don't have necessarily the good, the right climate forcing over hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of years. And we don't know all the land use histories, and so we can't fully know how much soil carbon is, is down below. And so we know that that's a big source of uncertainty, and we think that the atmospheric CO2 can help to constrain that. And what we found again, so in these bottoms, this, this bottom plot, this is um, two well-known atmospheric CO2 stations, Mauna Loa, that you'll probably heard of. Uh, we often see that reports of the Mauna Loa CO2 concentrations in the news, um, as well as the alert station up, um, I forget now whether it's northern Canada or northern US, but uh, very in the, up, up in the Arctic Circle. And so we take um, the modeled net CO2 exchange fluxes, we transport that through the atmosphere, and we get predictions from the model of the atmospheric CO2. And the prior curve there is, is our prior predictions again, before we've constrained any of these parameters. The observations are in red. Sorry for all the different colors here. We should really harmonize all of these. Um, and then the posterior um, simulations after we've optimized all these parameters are shown in green. And we show a much better fit to the observations, as we hope, as is always the case you know, when we're doing this right. And what we really see there is this, in the prior model, predicted too strong a trend in the rise in CO2 concentrations. And after we've optimized these parameters, we see a weaker trend in the atmospheric CO2 data that we've attributed mostly, at this point, to changes in respiration and the soil carbon content of scalar that we've optimized. Yes? Okay. So your SIF study shows that you can be also reduced. Uh, mm -hmm. that. So does that imply that your respiration would be even more overestimated? Yeah, yes. that's what we, we came to see, yeah. Yes, exactly. So these are real sort of brief results of what, um, what we've done with these three main data sets or four main data sets here so far. Um, so briefly getting on now to what can we learn after we've done these techni very technical implementations of using these data sets to optimize different parts of the model, what have we learned? And the answer right now is, is still very simple, still sort of working on some of the technical aspects um, that I'll mention towards the end. So just looking really briefly, what we're, we're looking at is really broad scale questions. Which part of the, the terrestrial biome is most of the land carbon sick? And where is that land carbon sick? How is that changing over time? Um, we also want to know how these estimates compare to other data constrained estimates. So these are the kinds of broad scale questions that we're looking at here. Um, so this is just a plot now of global GPP estimates that are split between the tropics and northern hemisphere and then a little bit in the southern hemisphere as well. So we're just looking at regional, very broad scale regional uh, distributions of, of where the main um, carbon uptake is occurring. And we see, um, so in the prior model here, 
we've got, um, it's, it's a very biased, high estimate of the global GDP. I should say that we're, in, we're comparing to an independent data-driven estimate. It's still a model. It's actually an upscale, global upscale estimate of all these flux power uh, measurements of GDP, but we're just using that for comparison rather than validation, um, a sort of full-scale validation. But So we have a prior model here. This is the um, estimate after we've constrained with the flux net, net ecosystem exchange. And we don't get much of a change really in that global estimate, probably mostly again because, as I mentioned, we're constraining the net fluxes and we're getting different compensating effects in the gross fluxes. The NDVI study that I did, uh, whilst we did constrain that growing season length, as I mentioned, it actually didn't have much of an impact on the amount of carbon we were taking up, but a bit of a reduction mostly um, in that northern hemisphere region, as, as we showed from that reduction in growing season length. Where we really got a change, as we saw in that difference map, was from using Pacific data. We might uh, hope that this is the case. Um, that because it's most most uh, linked, if you like, to the GPP, that we got most of the constraint from uh, the SIF data here. Um, and as I mentioned, a, a different a shift in the amount of carbon that's in that is being taken up in the northern hemisphere versus the tropics. And we're better matching this independent data dri driven estimate. Although, as I mentioned, that's not our key goal. We just want to try and get a good idea of, of what's going on. So the message here is that you know, satellite data can definitely be used more uh, to constrain this, this gross carbon uptake. There's lots of things still to be worked out, but it's a start. Where we really found a difference um, for the net ecosystem exchange was, was when we used the atmospheric CO2 concentration data. So I haven't shown all the different experiments here, um, but this was the net carbon sink that the model was predicting prior to any optimization. And after we constrained with the atmospheric CO2 data, we got a much bigger shift to a much greater sink, which also better matches this independent estimate that's derived from the global carbon budget, that global carbon project estimate, um, that where they're deriving the, um, the global carbon budget each year. So that was a sort of positive result that we're better matching that this is the land, this is the land surface CO2 sink. Uh, so that's positive, um, a lot more uptake, uh, a lot more, yeah, a lot more sink in the tropics there than we previously had, although I'll come back to that, that point in just a minute. So very, very, very um, broad scale implications of how our optimizations are changing our global um, carbon flux estimates. Um, so a few perspectives now for challenges that we face, issues with this work, I guess, um, or caveats, I should say, and, and how we can prove things in the future. So I'll come straight back to this, this plot here. What we want to do um, is compare these, what we call a bottom-up estimate, because we're uh, taking this model that is of the land surface and estimating uh, carbon fluxes based on our process knowledge. But we can compare this with um, what we call a top-down estimate from atmospheric inversions, which you may, may, may or may not have heard of. Atmospheric inversions take the same CO2 atmospheric concentration data that we use here, but instead of optimizing parameters in a biosphere model, they invert the atmospheric model to try and get the surface fluxes. Uh, they use, it's a very similar data simulation system as the one we're using, but what they're trying to retrieve is not parameter values, just these net surface fluxes. And they often take uh, their prior estimates of the fluxes from models like this. So it's, it's, they're related, but they're, they're sort of two different estimates. That's what we want to compare to now. This uh, land carbon sink that I show here actually doesn't account for any biomass burning, any deforestation. Uh, we don't have that in the model in the tropical regions that we're always seeing and talking about in the news. And we can estimate that is about one petagram of carbon a year. So we remove that, which uh, the CO2 emissions that come from biomass burning or deforestation. We have, this is the, the direct comparison here, and we remove 
some of the CO2 that we know is going out into the biomass um, burning, um, and this allows a more direct comparison with atmospheric CO2 um, inversions. So this is the, the overall net CO2 flux we get if we accounted for those emissions. And if we compare this then, this is our bottom-up estimate, and on the right here we have a bunch of these different land um, CO2 flux from atmospheric inversions. And they've taken the atmospheric data to estimate the surface fluxes. And they too are trying to, there's a whole bunch of different groups that are working on different inversions. Um, so they too look at a global sink, uh, which is com you can compare to this overall estimate here. And then they try and split it up between the northern hemisphere and the tropics. And I've highlighted these two in the purple and black here because this is a system that uses the orchidae uh, surface fluxes as their prior, so we can compare how well they're doing. So we see the global estimate, it's not quite the same, but it's not far off in terms of the global net CO2 land surface sink. But in terms of their split between the northern hemisphere and the tropics, it's very different. We've got much more of a sink in the tropics in our estimate than they have from the atmospheric CO2 inversion. So there are lots of different reasons why that may be the case. Issues with the, the process based models like Orchidae, issues with, with how they do some of the inversions and some of the site representation. Um, but we're not quite there yet in terms of harmonizing our estimates of even the split between the northern and tropical lands in terms of the net CO2 sink between different estimates. So it's a challenge, that's challenge number one I've identified to work on. Another thing we've done is, this is the map actually of all the sites we've used so far from all the different data sets. Um, and we've been looking at these studies kind of individually for the most part for now. But what we're working on is combining all these different data streams in one assimilation together. And you'd think, you'd make this assumption that the more data you have, the more information you have uh, from different sources, you're constraining different processes in the model, and you therefore should get a better fit, a better estimate. But one thing that we see is that we get sort of different estimates. This, this is the plot of this that net ecosystem exchange again globally split between the different regions. These are all the sort of combinations, individual fluxes, NDVI, CO2 data individually, and then combinations of, of two or the three of them. And we get different overall budget estimates and different splits between the northern hemisphere and the tropics. And the reason for that is that um, there are actually some sort of inconsistencies between the model and the data that we don't really fully understand yet. Um, and we're not representing, we're not taking into account in the uncertainty of these data simulation systems. This is what we think. And so we've, we've studied this more to show you a bunch of different papers that are looking at this issue at really at site level, where we take one data stream, like we take the fluxes, we optimize just with the fluxes, and we compare to, say, the satellite data. Um, and we then take the satellite data and just optimize with those data and compare to the fluxes. And what we often see is that when you optimize with one data set, you actually cause a degradation in the fit to the other data set that you're not including in the optimization which shows some kind of inconsistencies that you've got to account for, missing processes in the model. Uh, one of the things that I think is most, is most of cause for concern when we're combining all these data sets is um, related to how we represent canopies in the model. And therefore, when we're looking at the satellite data, specifically related to phenology, we're not really comparing light for light. Uh, what the satellite is measuring is very different from what we're representing in the model. So we talk a lot about this um, in detail in these papers. Um, so it's a real challenge that we've got to address. But one way that we can address this is by, for example, and I talk about the canopy, currently in the models we have what we call a big leaf approach. So we just have a lump of green, a sort of 3D green lump that represents the canopy. But as I just mentioned, that's not what the satellites are, sent, uh, are sort of measuring. Uh, they're measuring this complicated, heterogeneous canopy in, space, in both horizontal and vertical space. And so there's the hope that with developing the processes in the model to better represent canopies, 
we may reduce some of the inconsistencies between the model and the data and resolve some of these challenges with using um, different data streams. Uh, so that's that's a, a hope of mine and a hypothesis of some of the technical challenges we face with the data simulation system. Um, we'll be better able to get the sort of how the light is transmitted through the canopy. And um, with these new types of data, new sort of types of model, we have the data now to help us um, just test these models. One of the instruments on the International Space Station recently is the JEDI instrument. It's a full waveform LIDAR and it measures um, the canopy structure. So we can use these new types of data that we just didn't have before to better test and, and parameterize these more complex representations of the canopy. Um, the other issue though is, so this is just a real quick sort of list of, of what's in these current versions of the models. Carbon cycle, uh, nutrient limitations, and methane there. And we're adding in this all this representation of human activity. So while some of the, the model developments are going to be really good, hopefully, for um, using data to constrain the model, uh, there's so much development going on that it might become very complex very quickly. And, and we're adding more uncertainty that we've got to constrain. So that's a sort of caveat of, of the model development that we've got to deal with. And so. But the hope is, you know, we've only really used three, four data sets. There's much more data out there now, and people are really gathering a lot of data into, into networks that we can easily access as modelers. So we need to do more assessments in terms of which data sets are really needed, which level of model complexity is really needed. Um, but the hope is that, you know, as more data are out there, we can really address these questions. We also need to think about, we've, we've thought about very short-term fluxes now. But for carbon climate feedbacks, we need to think about longer-term trends. So we need to be thinking about uh, things like tree rings that really estimate the carbon allocation into woody biomass over time. Uh, also soil carbon estimates that may be able to tell us longer-term soil carbon processes. This is uh, where I'm headed to next in, in what I want to do with this data simulation work as well as using some of these kinds of manipulation experiments to, and, and phase experiments, the pre-air CO2 enrichment experiments that are looking at how vegetation is responding more to climate and CO2. We need to be looking at those kinds of sensitivities for estimating more these longer term feedbacks to climate. So the answer, I think, is really more data and more collaboration with data providers to understand that. Um, but in the meantime, lots of technical data simulation challenges, so we need a lot of people working on this. So if you're interested, please do think about working in this kind of thing. <laughs> That's my plug for today. And that we really need to do this sort of now. You know, we're getting these reports out of what happens with 1.5 degrees rise in temperature, and it's already alarming. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, if we, if we don't constrain the uncertainty in these carbon cycle projections, and we don't get an estimate of whether the, the, the land is going to remain a sink or not, then we could be looking at much more alarming reports in the future. <laughs>